Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Dan Trotter, Pretty Good Bible Studies. The video that we're going to undertake now is the first in probably two videos concerning house church elders. If you're interested in house church ecclesiology, I would uh, suggest to you my house church playlist, which you can look up here as you see it on the screen, that you can look it up on YouTube, where I have lots and lots and lots of videos about how to do the New Testament church with an emphasis on how we can do it today and how the American church is so totally and completely different than the New Testament house church. I hope you enjoy this video. All right, house church elders. Let's get started. I'm going to give you an overview here. I'm going to divide this PowerPoint into four sections, uh, only two of which we'll do in this video. The first section is an introduction, and the second section is where I will prove to you scripturally and beyond a shadow of a doubt that the elders of the New Testament church were plural. There was not the pastor. There was plural elders. And then I'm going to uh, have a section on homegrown elders, the idea that elders grow up in the church in, to which they minister, over which they uh, exercise oversight, and they're not hired hands from a theological seminary from afar off. And then I'm going to look at special problems that arise uh, in discussing elders, for example, what happens if your house church is so small you can only get one elder? For another example, should you have formal elders or is informal elders okay? A third problem is, for example, uh, can uh, do apostles serve as elders when they first start a church before they take off to start their next church? But we'll do that in the next video. Right now, let's uh, start here with uh, an introduction to the subject of house church elders. So this is part one. I'm going to give you a general, a general description of house church elders, and then I'm going to talk about the duties of house church elders. All right, here's a general description. In the New Testament church, elders were plural. There was more than one of them. There was not the pastor. They were non-hierarchical. There was no senior pastors and associate pastors. They were just pastors or elders, depending on which term you use. There was no hierarchy, no assistant pastors, no teaching pastors, no mission pastors, no, oh, we give all these names to pastors today in the American church. They didn't have that in the New Testament church. The pastors were homegrown. The elders were homegrown. They were appointed from amongst the brethren who uh, lived with them and worshiped with them for a period of time so they got to be known and their maturity developed and by the time they were getting ready to be recognized as elders by golly everybody in the church knew who they were and trusted them they didn't go out and hire somebody from outside a hired hand speaking of hired hands the next uh, characteristic or attribute of a new testament elder is he was unsalaried there is not anywhere in the New Testament says that pastors in the New Testament church were paid. Now, I know you're probably thinking of some, but I'm going to show you in a future video on home church finance uh, about that. I'm not going to deal with this in this PowerPoint, in, either in this video or the next video. I'm going to wait till we get to a separate video on house church finance. And last of all, house church elders were male. There were no women elders. According to 1 Timothy 2.12, this was an apostolic command from the apostle Paul. We're not going to talk about that in this video either. I've got a future video coming on sisters in the church. And we'll deal with the issue of whether sisters can be elders or not. And then, of course, that will take care of the problem of, of, the, of this attribute of New Testament elders that, that they were male. All right, so that's a general description, an overview. Now, of all these, let me back up a minute here. Uh, of all these, uh, of the general, of the five important attributes of a New Testament elder, I'm only going to take up two in depth in this video. I'm going to take up plural elders. I'm going to take up plural, plural elders and homegrown elders. I'm going to mention very briefly, non-hierarchical elders in this introduction. So I'm going to take up, I actually I'm going to take up uh, these three topics right here. Plural elders, non-hierarchical elders, and homegrown elders. 
I'm going to leave unsalaried elders and male elders to a future video. All right, let's start out here. The general description of house church elders, first thing I'm going to say here is that they're non-hierarchical. Elders do not have titles, as in Reverend Smith or Dr. Smith or Right Reverend Smith or Your Most Holy Righteousness Smith, Bishop Smith, Apostle Smith, and, you know, all the types of titles that you can see. I, I'm from the South, the Bible Belt. There's, you, I, I like to go down and look at signs on the side of the road. It's incredible the n number of names that Christians can think of to call their leaders. But in the New Testament church, there was no such thing as a title. Now, here's a, the relevant verse, Matthew 23, verses 8 through 11. Jesus says this to his disciples, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. This is King James, obviously. All of you are brethren. So this, that's, what, that's the only title I would, a, a quote-unquote title, that I would ever call a church leader. I'd call him brother. That's about as far as I'm going to go because of what Jesus said here. He said, don't be called rabbi. And these, are, these are future apostles he's talking to, people who wrote the New Testament canon, Most some of them. And they were not even to be called rabbi, which was a common uh, honorific given to teachers in, the, in, in uh, the times of Jesus. And Jesus said, don't do that. Call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. This reminds me, I was with a friend who lived next door to an Episcopal priest. Episcopal priest was about, he wasn't half my age, but he was three quarters my age. He was younger than me. And he wanted to be called by Father David. And uh, he shook hands with me, and he says, Hi, I'm Father David. And I said, Hi, I'm Dan. And as we talked later, I refused to call him Father David. I called him David. He's probably still mad at me. Probably thought I was rude to him. But I'm not going to call anybody my father on earth because of this scripture. I do not understand how Protestants, or any Christian for that matter, can look at, read this verse and justify giving fancy titles to leaders. All it does is it enforces the clergy lady distinction. It cuts against everything we believe in, supposedly we believe in as Protestants, the priesthood of all believers, and yet we do it. I remember one time there was, uh, I've always been interested in church, obviously. That's why I'm doing these videos, and that's why I've focused on this for so long. And I remember I was in a Baptist church one time, and there was some kind of a meeting that had something to do with church, church government, ecclesiology. I don't know. I forgot. But that's the sort of thing I'm interested in. And I was getting ready to go attend to it, and then I was informed that only members of the clergy could attend. Only someone with a robe and a collar. And so that was one other thing that turned me away from the institutional church and helped me start walking away from it because of stuff like that, the constant division between clergy and the other brethren. Jesus said, don't call each other all these titles. Call each other brethren. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Servants usually don't have titles. I mean, you know, and this is a, the word for this is slave, you know. All right, so let's just say servant to make it milder. How many servants do you give a title? Hi, Servant Smith. Hi, Servant Jones. You don't do that, but we do it. How? I don't know if a pastor will ever be watching this video, but if you do, how can you justify giving yourself a title given this verse? Whoever shall exalt himself shall be shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Well, there you have it. Elders do not have titles. Moving on, elders do not have an office. The office of elder, how many times have you heard that expression? But it's interesting that that expression is not in the Scriptures. And you say, whoa, wait a minute, what about 1 Timothy 3.1? I've got the New American Standard Bible here. Paul tells Timothy, it is a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. See there, that verse proves me wrong, right? Well, no, it doesn't. For, why? Office is not in the original Greek. Now, for all you Greek freaks out here, I've got it for you. Atis, episcopes, hor, hor uh, The word's not in there, office. It's just not in there. 
The NIV translates this passage, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer. Well, now there, that's, that's a little different. I think that's closer to the truth, closer to the Greek. Sets his heart on being an overseer. Uh, an overseer is an elder. An elder is a function. It's not an office. Here's what Vine says about 1 Timothy 3.1. In 1 Timothy 3.1, the word office has nothing to represent it in the original. So if you didn't believe me, you can believe Vine's, okay? It's not in there. Now here's something else that elders do not have. They do not have a special seminary education. They did not have seminaries in the New Testament. That's a theological matter. That's something that should take your, take your notice, should, should, should take you aback. They didn't have specially trained clergy. Those were just ordinary people who learn the Word, learn to walk with Jesus, and learn how to train their people and to protect their people and to raise them up. Well, think about that. You don't have to spend a fortune on a seminary graduate. Here's what we do. We get somebody 24 years old, wet behind the ears. We get him to come in. He knows nothing about it. He might not even have children. He doesn't know how to raise kids. And he's up there telling all these people uh, how, to, how to live their Christian life. And he can't be a model for that because he's too young. And uh, we wonder why pastors have such a low appreciation of their jobs. I've seen these polls that said, what is the, the job, people that have the least job satisfa satisfaction? Lawyers is way up there. I used to be a lawyer, so I've always noticed that. But also pastors have very, very, very poor job satisfaction. I'm telling you, folks. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be pastors, not traditional church pastors, because the job is horrible. It's miserable most of the time. Now, yeah, I know you're going to say, yeah, I know somebody really enjoys it. I'm sure they are. But I, for every one you can find, I can find lots of other pastors who are just miserable in the job, who'd love to get out of it. That's something that's not mentioned because, of course, a pastor's not going to mention it because people might, his congregation might kick him out of his job. If he says something like that, he's not going to say something like that because he doesn't like to sound like he's complaining. But I've talked to enough of them to know that this is true. Pastors do not like the job. Why? We don't have this in the New Testament. It's not there. We don't have special seminary trained clergy. All right, let's look now at the duties of house church elders. They lead by example, not by command, but by example. They oversee the flock. One of the words for elders in the New Testament is an overseer. They protect the flock from the many wolves and creeps that are out there. They equip the flock so that they will minister their gifts with mutual ministry. For example, in the church meeting in 1 Corinthians 12, 14, and, or as they go out into the world and do their, their work, their uh their uh, work in the world, they're equipped by the elders. The elders encourage and exhort. They maintain the quality of the meeting. If, if, if the meeting gets boring because people are talking chit-chat, they're talking about irrelevant things, or if they're talking about harmful things, or if they're talking about doctrinally suspect things, that kind of thing, the elders got to make sure that this kind of stuff doesn't go on. They settle disputes when consensus cannot be found. 99% of the times consensus can be found, but if things get serious. I had a friend in our house church one time that believed in consensual church government and practiced it, but they had a wolf in there, had a heretic. I mean, when I use heretic, I, I, I don't like to use the word heretic. I use heretic uh, when it refers to someone who can't recite the Nicene Creed. I mean, something real serious. Uh I don't call John MacArthur a heretic because he's an extreme cessationist, for example. I don't like it, but I'm not going to call him a heretic. Well, these guys were real heretics. They were denying the resurrection of Jesus. And when they had the meeting, when they finally kicked them out, they started saying, well, we've all got to come to a consensus. We've all got to come to a consensus. And we don't agree that we should stop preaching this heresy. And the leader of one of the, the chief elder of the church, he looked at him, he says, no. The time for discussion is over. You're out of here. So elders, they're the stopgap when consensus can't be found. Elders, of course, teach. They guard against doctrinal error. They lead by example. Well, I've already said that over here. That's a repeat by mistake. They encourage the weak. They do marriage counseling. They handle logistics. For example, uh, in a you know, in the house church, you got to say, where's the meeting going to be next week? Has everybody been informed? 
Uh, is the food situation working out all right? Is somebody damaged the house? Is it being taken care of? That kind of thing. They fix problems such as that. Oh, there's not enough food for the Lord's Supper. Visitors came, wasn't enough food. What are we going to do about that? Unidentifying comments, people talking about politics, sports, uh, shopping, family issues and stuff that doesn't really edify the body, children destroying the host homes, things like that that come up, and the elder's got to be, he's got, there's got to be somebody responsible, and that's the elder. And, of course, if it's possible to train other elders. Again, this is difficult in small churches to find leadership material. I used to teach management in college, and I'd always say, you know, manage, management material is very rare in the population of businessmen. Now, management can be taught. I do believe that. I don't believe it's something that's born. I mean, you can train manage, management. I believe you can train elders, too. But they need to have the gift. They need to be supernaturally equipped with the gift of being an elder by, by the gifts that have been given to them by Jesus. But anyway, that's a, that's a summary of, all, of what house church elders do. You see, there's a lot of stuff they can do. That's why they're very important. A lot of times people get the idea that, um, you know, you know, we don't need elders. We don't need leaders. We're tired of tyrannical pastors, cult-like churches, so we're just going to meet together or two or three gathered together we'll just meet together and enjoy each other's presence no you've got to have elders a church that does not have leadership and when i say leaders i mean elders if you don't have it you're going to die i'm not a prophet but i will predict that with 100 percent certainty you will die you got to have church elders all right so much for my introduction now let's look at Plural elders, plural elders, uh, which is uh, an important topic. Um, this idea is actually caught on outside of the house church. I've, I've heard of a lot of bigger churches having plural elders, which shocks me because when I first got into this years ago, this is what got me into the New Testament house church is because I looked at the scriptures and I couldn't find any pastor. And then I got tired of pastors abusing the flock. And I got tired of listening to boring sermons done by the pastor every Sunday. And I just was looking for something else. And all of a sudden I found out this. And I forgot where I got it from. I don't know if it was Watchman Nee or I, don't, I forgot. But it occurred to me, I said, uh, you know, the New Testament church didn't have plural elders. So I started mentioning this. And I remember one friend of mine said, what are you, you're saying the church, uh, is the head of the church is a four-headed monster? And I just shook my head. I said, maybe I should just keep my mouth shut. Well, no. It's clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that New Testament church elders were plurals. We're going to talk about that next. Plural elders, more than one elder. I'm going to give you scriptural proof in part in subpart A and subpart B. I'm going to talk about the benefits of having plural elders. All right, here's my introductory remarks about and scriptural proof about plural elders. As I give this scriptural proof, I want to say this in an introductory fashion. It is extraordinarily easy to prove plurality using the scriptures. I mean, it's so easy, it's not even funny. But I'm going to do it just to prove to you. And it's also easy to find Bible scholars who admit plurality. I've got a ton of quotes. I can give them to you. All Bible scholars admit plurality. Well, then why don't we do it today? And it's, we go back to the same problem. People will say, well, what's right for the New Testament church was right for them. But times have changed. We live in the modern world. What's right for that culture is right for them. What's right for us is right for our culture. All right? Every time I hear that, I say, well, it sounds awful postmodern to me. I Listen, I believe in biblical authority, in the authority of the apostles. And I believe in their patterns, the apostle, apostles' patterns, the way they did things. And the way they did it is they set up churches with plural elders. They did not have one pastor in charge of a church. Here's a quote from Watchman Nee to get us started. Nowhere in God's Word do we find anyone referred to by name as a pastor. And I will say amen to that. All right, here's the first scriptural proof. The Ephesian church had plural elders. Now I'm going to give you three interchangeable terms that describe elders. And these three interchangeable terms come from this famous passage in Acts I'm about to give you. And I, I want you to note that when we look at these interchangeable terms, they're all plural Elders is one of the terms. This is in Acts 20. I'm going to quote just two verses from that chapter, verse, chapter, verse 17 and verse 28. The context is this. 
Paul is on his way back from his third journey, and he stops at Miletus, which is the port city of Ephesus, Ephesus being on Ephesus and Miletus being on the southwestern coast of the Anatolian Peninsula there, as he's getting ready to, say, to sail back to Jerusalem across the Mediterranean. Now, he wants to talk to the Ephesian elders, and so he calls them out to Miletus so he doesn't have to leave his ship. All right, so this is what Luke says in recording this scene. From Miletus, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders, and the Greek word there is presbyterus, presbyterus, elders, presbyterus, from which we get the term presby presbyterian, called to him the elders of the church. Be on guard for yourselves, dropping down to verse 28, be on guard for yourselves, he says to these elders, and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And the Greek word there is episkopus. Overseers. And from episkopus, we get the word episcopal, or bishop. Having to do with bishops is episcopal. Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd. The Greek word is poi, poi, poi my name, there's an infinitive there, poi my name, uh, to shepherd or feed or to pastor the church of God. Pastor is the English word that means to feed. Uh, so to pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So there we have the term elder, overseer, and shepherd. Now this particular translation is the New American Standard Version, but the translations go all over the place on this. Elders is usually... So you could translate that presbyters. You could translate overseers as bishops. You could translate shepherds as pastors. Their English, like I say, is all over the place. So that's why I emphasize the Greek here. There's three Greek words, one of which is elders, which emphasizes the uh, relative age, either natural or spiritual, of the leaders of the church. The word overseers emphasizes the function of the leader of the church. He oversees, he gives oversight to the church. Uh, administratively, and the third term is shepherd. He feeds the church, which means he teaches them doctrinally and, and spiritually. Three different functions that blend together. There's no hard line between them, uh, and uh, they all refer to the same people, the leaders in the church. Now, this is rock solid. This is not controversial. If anybody disagreed with that, I would laugh, 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 because he can't prove it. Nobody disagrees with this. All right, now, Note that all of these three terms for elders in the New Testament church, every one of them is plural. He called to him the elders of the Ephesian church, the overseers of the Ephesian church. Well, I'm sorry, two of them are plural, elders and overseers, two pastor. Uh, the pastor is not a, it's not a noun, it's a verb there. But you'll notice that these plural elders and plural overseers are called a pastor. So he's not referring to one pastor, he's calling to plural pastors, all right? So this is rock solid. Now, as I mentioned, the traditional church titles come from the Greek. Elder is uh, a word for presbyter, as in Presbyterian. Oversee, we get the word bishop, episkopos, comes from the Greek word there. And to shepherd is to pastor, the shepherd of the flock. All right, moving to our second scriptural proof that the New Testament church had plural elders. The apostles appointed elders in new churches. They, they didn't appoint a pastor or the pastor. Let's look at Acts 14, 23. And when they, that's referring to Paul and Barnabas, had appointed elders, plural elders, for them in every church. The them is the churches on the first missionary journey, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, Pisidian, Antioch. And when they, the apostles there, had appointed elders, plural, for them in every church, that was established on the first journey there. Having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord whom they had believed. And then they went off back to Antioch and then on to the Jerusalem council. Okay, Paul and Barnabas had appointed elders. Now in a future video, when I'm going to talk about this idea of ordaining or appointing elders, I'm going to make the case that this was a mere recognition of homegrown elders. Okay, so But we're not going to get into that right now. My point right now is, is that they were elders that were recognized by Paul and Barnabas. They didn't go out and appoint a pastor over every church. Here's another verse that says the same thing. Titus 1.5 says this, For this reason I, talking to Paul, left you Titus. Left, he's, he, Paul is writing to Titus, and he says, For this reason I left you, Titus, in Crete, that you might set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Paul did not tell Titus to appoint a one-man pastor. 
Third scriptural proof that the elders of the New Testament church were plural. The Jerusalem church had plural elders. The mother church. This is Acts 15. I'm going to uh, pick out verses 2, 4, 6, and verse 22. This is the famous uh, description of the Jerusalem church, of the Jerusalem council. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, this is in Antioch, uh, they were debating legalists that had come up from Jerusalem, and Paul, of course, their gospel, the apostle of grace, didn't want to hear anything about you needed to keep the law to get saved. Barnabas was with him, they argued with him, and the brethren there, interesting, you know, the brethren, consensual group, not the elders, but the brethren at the church of Antioch, sent Paul and Barnabas and certain others that accompanied Paul and Barnabas that, uh, to go up to Jerusalem to solve the problem. And it says, they, Paul and Barnabas, should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. The apostles of the church of Jerusalem would be Peter, James, and John. Now let me just stop here. Uh, Peter and John, Peter is obviously an apostle. John, the son of Zebedee, he was obviously an apostle too. James, the brother of the Lord, is sort of questionable. I, I, I looked up the Encyclopedia Britannica. We know he wasn't one of the original 12, but I looked up the Encyclopedia Britannica, and it says that 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says that Paul recognized James as an apostle. Actually, 1 Corinthians 15, 7 doesn't say that. It says, uh, it's talking about the appearance, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, and he says he appeared to James and then to the apostles. It doesn't say he appeared to James and then the other apostles. He said he appeared to James. It's an inference, okay? Well, let's just give it to him and say James was an apostle. So James, Peter, and John, and let's just say that Peter, James, and John were the apostles at Jerusalem. Okay, fine. Those, those are the apostles that helped start the church there in Jerusalem. But notice that they had elders with them. There's not one apostle leading the church, and there's not one elders. Now, apostles, that's not their job to lead churches, of course. They go out and start churches. But uh, they, can, they, can, they settle down at churches sometimes. Paul settled down in Ephesus for a couple of years, Corinth for 18 months. They worked outside the church in their own teaching ministry, but, you know, you can settle down in a, in a particular place. An apostle can. Peter, as a matter of fact, went out doing apostolic work, but a lot of times he stayed an elder. And I would make the case that when they stay in the church, they really function as elders, not as apostles. And when they leave the church, they have to function as apostles. But be that as it may, the point is, is that there were plural elders at Jerusalem that were that were receiving Paul and Barnabas. The church at Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas to see the plural elders at Jerusalem. Now, of course, if we're doing it, how do we do it? We'd send, we'd send them to go talk to the pastor. But we're not in the New Testament church. And when they, Paul and Barnabas, arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. So Peter, James, and John, and the elders, whoever they were. And they reported all that God had done with them. And the apostles and elders came together to look into the matter, the matter of legalism. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent this letter by them, the apostle and the elders, to the brethren to the, to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Notice how many times elders is mentioned in that. Not once is the pastor mentioned. Proof number four, Peter addresses plural elders, not the pastor. This is in his uh Scripture here in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 2, Peter says this to his addressees, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ. By the way, I just mentioned that Peter could be considered an elder in Jerusalem. Notice how he calls himself your fellow elder. So Peter, who was obviously an apostle, is also called an elder. I say this because I think that we, we draw too hard a distinctions between ministry gifts. Ministry gifts are functions. They're not titles. They're not office, offices. Sometimes Peter functioned as an elder. Sometimes he functioned as an apostle. Okay, but anyway, that's not my main point here. My main point here is that Peter is exhorting elders among you. He's exhorting the elders among you, not the pastor, not one elder, but elders, plural. Fifth argument from the scriptures that the New Testament church had plural elders. The plurally from Antioch Syria and Antioch to uh, Jerusalem because of the famine that in Claudius' time in AD 50, that plural relief money was sent to plural elders. It was not sent to the pastor of the Jerusalem church, Acts 11, 29 through 30. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, this is the disciples at Antioch, Syria and Antioch, where Paul and Barnabas were, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. 
And this they did, sending it, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders, plural, in the church at Jerusalem, not to the pastor. Argument number six, plural elders are given double honor, not the pastor. This is the famous scripture in 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double, worthy of double honor. Now, I must say here that many people interpret this as saying this justifies paying a an elder or a pastor a salary no it does not that word honor there i'm going to show you when we get to the video on, on uh, finance absolutely does not mean a wage there's other greek words that can be wage get, get, that can mean that can mean wages the greek word that's used here means honor uh, which can be like an honorarium which is a gift and I do believe in giving gifts to uh, church leaders, but I don't believe in paying them a salary to make them a hired hand, to make them an employee of a church. But that's for later. Right now, let's point out that it's the elders who rule well get these double gifts, these double honor. And it could be uh, uh, esteem as well as money. The word is ambiguous. But who, whatever that word means, it's not just one pastor who gets it. I mean, if you want to take this as a salary, okay, well, then do you pay your assistant pastor and your other pastors? Because it's not just one. It's a bunch of them that are considered worthy of double honor. There's no one the pastor who is considered worthy of double honor. Argument number seven, and this is one of my favorite arguments, not one New Testament letter is written to the pastor. Not one of all. When I used to do house church conferences, I used to uh, get printed out a list of all the salutations and all the New Testament letters. And I'd say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read all the salutations of the New Testament letters. Now, since this is, there's a, this is a lot of words that I've got to read here, I'm going to read them very fast. But I want you to listen to me and tell me when I get to the salutation to the pastor. And I say, you know, if you were writing to a church today, You'd write it to the pastor, wouldn't you? Well, in the New Testament church, you can't find that. It's not in there. Doesn't exist. Most of the New Testament letters were written to the brethren, not to the pastor. They weren't even written, most of them, not to the elders, but to the brethren. That's, that even makes my case even stronger. But none are written to the pastor. Not one. Now, that ought to tell you something. Only three New Testament passages even mention leaders at all. They're not addressed. They're just mentioned. Now, I'm going to go through those three passages in just a minute. But let me stop here and say that when I first got into house church stuff, the, the single pastor idea was the thing that, that just struck me the hardest. It's the easiest part of New Testament ecclesiology to practice. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of, I I've, I've saw a big church, uh, well, I, mean, I shouldn't say big, medium-sized church, maybe 500 people in it, had, plur had four plural pastors. Uh, I, you see this idea more and more and more because of accountability, because of scandal and so forth, and I think that's great. Uh, so if you want to start somewhere, start here with plural, uh, plural pastors. Uh, okay, only three passages even mention leaders. Uh, and not one of these three that mention leaders mentioned, mentions the pastor, just leaders. Okay, so let's look at them. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. To all the saints, Paul is writing to the Philippians. To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi together with the overseers and deacons. Overseers, plural. So Paul, he mentions the overseers. But you notice that he first mentions the saints in general, which is kind of like the brethren. The saints, and he, and he throws in overseers. Big deal. The overseers were not, did not have prominence in Paul's mind when he was writing letters. Hebrews 13, this is my favorite one here, Hebrews 13, 22 and 24. This is not in the salutation. This is at the end of the letter. The author of the, of the book says this, Brothers, I have written you only a short letter. So he finally addresses them directly, and he doesn't address the leaders. He addresses brothers, and then he tells the brothers, Brothers, greet all your leaders. The leaders are not even directly addressed. The letter is written to the brothers who are then asked to greet the leaders. And you notice that leaders is plural. It's plural, folks. There was no single pastor in any of the Jewish Christian churches that were being addressed. All right, now let's look at the, the third uh, scripture, 1 Peter 5, 1, 4. To the elders among you, I appeal to, as a fellow elder. 
to the elders among you. So Peter does, he does mention the leaders, but it's not the pastor, it's a plural leader. Those are the only three times you'll find a leader mentioned in the New Testament uh, scriptures. Most of the time it's just to the brethren. All right, here's the eighth uh, scriptural proof that pastors were plural. Paul was unaware of the Jerusalem church's pastor. In Galatians 2.9, Peter says this, to the Galatians, and recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, Cephas is Peter, James and Peter and John, that's the apostles there at the church, recognizing the grace that had been given to me, the apostles who were reputed to be pillars, reputed. Paul apparently was not even sure who the, the big shot leaders of the church were. They were reputed to be pillars. And so then James and Cephas and John, these reputed pillars, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So that's how uh, unemphasized leadership was in the first century church. Paul would have known the pastor of the first, of the first church in Christendom, the mother church. He would have known who that pastor was. If such a person existed, he obviously did not exist. As I said, this is a slam dunk. Don't argue with me on this one. I'm not going to take any more time to argue with anybody on this. This is a beyond a shadow of a doubt proof. The early New Testament had plural leadership. Notice that uh, these apostles who were not, uh, who were not really, they were probably functioning as elders. Because you notice it doesn't call them apostles, it calls them pillars. I would, you know, they were functioning as elders as they were there in the Jerusalem church. There were more than one of them. There were three of them. All right, now let's look at the benefits of plural elders. First of all, you don't end up with a dictator. It's hard because the, the elders check each other. Somebody starts getting powerful, the other elders can check. Now, I have seen situations where I remember one church in India had plural elders and one, um, and I think it was three, and some of the elders started telling one of the elders he shouldn't go on mission trips. Now, this let me point this out. The elders have the authority to oversee the church. They do not have the authority to tell another elder what kind of outside work he's going to do. That is an abuse of authority, and I have seen that at least twice with horrible results. This Finally, this guy said, fine, you're not going to let me go out and be an, uh, an apostle. Oh, well, I hate to use that word apostle. might get somebody in the Reformed camp to upset. You won't let me be a missionary? Well, then I'm leaving and I'm gone. Okay, so that was unfortunate. But that one elder could not tell the church what to do. And the elder should not be able to tell the worker what he should do either. I'm going to talk about that in the, future, in the last video in this house church playlist called The Church and the Work. But at any rate, it, to get back to my point here, it's hard to have a dictator when you've got three or four other elders telling you what you can't do. There's more protection for the flock because you've got more people looking out for wolves. There's more wisdom and a multitude of counselors. There's much wisdom. The workload is distributed. There's a division of labor. You have mutual encouragement among, among the elders. The elders can get together and talk. By the way, I don't believe in outside elders meetings outside the church. That's not in the scripture, so that's just my personal opinion. But that sort of emphasizes clergy laity distinction too when people do that. And I think it can lead to some misunderstandings and people talking about other people. And, you know, I think it's better to, uh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be hard and fast on that. But in general, I don't think it's a good idea might be necessary in some cases. All right, that finishes my discussion of the first half of my house church elders uh, PowerPoint. I hope you enjoyed this. Once again, I remind you, if you want to see some more stuff on uh, church government or other aspects of the house church, there's the Lord's Supper is a full meal, things like that, please check out this uh, playlist. I think you would enjoy it. I hope you enjoyed this video.